Oh, the 2010s. From the birth of Instagram, to our obsession with superheroes, to the rise of the streaming wars. The 2010s were a decade that solidified a lot of the technology, themes, and trends that we still experience today, both in cinema and outside of it. We've already covered why 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s movies look and feel the way they do. So in this video, we're taking the next logical step and covering the 2010s to see why movies from that decade have that certain look and overall feel to them. We have a lot to talk about, so let's not waste any more time and jump right into it. Most decades have some categories or genres of movies that are more common than the rest. Specific genres that you can say defined the decade, and the 2010s are no different. They might actually be the decade where the genres that dominated were more blatantly obvious than in the decades before. And there is one genre that comes to mind immediately, superhero movies. Five of the 10 highest grossing films from that decade were superhero films. We even had Avengers Endgame taking the top spot as the highest grossing film of all time for a period until Avatar was re-released and took it back. If that doesn't show you how absolutely dominating these types of films were, then I don't know what would. There were so many of them and they were so popular at the box office that superhero films are now largely considered to be their own genre. Even though there is some variety between the films, especially when you consider ones like Logan or Deadpool that basically follow their own formula, they're still grouped under the umbrella of the superhero film genre. Superhero movies were almost a surefire way to generate a massive amount of revenue. Even some of the lesser known superheroes were adopted onto the big screen, either as part of a larger franchise or getting their own standalone releases. And on the topic of superhero movies, throughout the 2010s, it felt like every second film franchise had to be part of some larger cinematic universe. Now, cinematic universes aren't anything new. They've existed since the 1930s with the Universal Monster Universe that contained movies such as Dracula, Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and The Wolfman. And we continued to get new cinematic universes from time to time, but the massive success of the MCU took this to a whole other level. It technically started in 2008 with Marvel's Iron Man, but it wasn't until the 2010s where we saw so many other studios trying to replicate the success with their own intellectual properties. There's the DC Extended Universe that started with 2013's Man of Steel, the Conjuring Universe, which started with The Conjuring, the Monsterverse with films like Godzilla and King Kong and so many more. In the 2010s, it seemed like studios planned universes for franchises before they even knew if the first film would be successful. But the thing is that most of these universes didn't do that well. And the ones that did, like the MonsterVerse, are much more limited in size than the MCU. And even though the MonsterVerse is called a cinematic universe, I would say it's debatable based on its size. For what it's worth though, I've heard a few times now that people are getting cinematic universe fatigue, especially when it comes to Marvel because of how many films and TV shows are coming out now on a regular basis. Okay, but onto another genre that defined the 2010s, horror. The 2000s weren't too great for the horror genre. We saw a lot of found footage movies that were trying to replicate the hype of the Blair Witch Project to varying degrees of success. And with the rise in popularity of Saw, we saw horror films take a different direction. They weren't as scary as they were unnerving and gruesome. But the 2010s were a pretty great decade when it comes to the horror genre. Some of the most memorable films from that decade, at least for us here at Filmstack, were horror films. Get Out, Us, Hereditary, Midsommar, The Witch, The Lighthouse, It Follows, A Quiet Place, The Babadook, and many more great films were released in the 2010s. And a lot of them were ones that were fairly unique and followed their own formula. But let's talk about another genre that defined the decade. Except this time, it's more the death of a genre. I'm talking about rom-coms and maybe even traditional comedies in general. Since 2010, Hollywood has deprioritized rom-coms in the comedy genre. These films are still being made, but more often than not, they're straight to DVD, or in today's case, straight to some streaming service. Comedy in today's blockbuster films is more intertwined within other genres. Superhero films tend to have comedic undertones. Action films are the same way, and this contributes to the success of those films. Even though we're no longer in the 2010s, I just watched two films that really made me think about how comedy in the film industry has evolved over the past couple of decades. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, and Barbie. Barbie is somewhat of a more traditional type of comedy with a very heartwarming story, but it's still very unique and different when compared to comedies from the 80s and 90s. And Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning is that type of film that I think scratches the comedy itch without being a traditional comedy. It knows when to take things seriously and when to take a step back and provide the audience with a few laughs. It's first and foremost an action film that has comedic undertones, similar to how Marvel and a lot of other movies these days are made. Don't get me wrong though, Comedy isn't dead. It's just evolved into something very different than what we became used to before the 2010s. Bah, 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 bah. 
We can't discuss movies from the 2010s without talking about the creation and massive rise of A24. Founded in 2012, A24 is an American independent entertainment company, and during the 2010s, they blasted into the spotlight of the film industry. These days, seeing an A24 logo in a trailer or the beginning of a movie almost guarantees we're about to watch a banger. There is something about A24 films where you sort of know what you're getting into, but at the same time, they usually leave you thinking about them for days. They often put actors and actresses we've come to know for certain types of roles into roles that showcase their acting chops. Roles such as Daniel Radcliffe playing a corpse in Swiss Army Man, Robert Pattinson in The Lighthouse or Good Time, Willem Dafoe in The Lighthouse, and more recently, Brendan Fraser in The Whale. They have been involved in some of the most amazing movies from the 2010s and are continuing to be involved in films that are making waves and becoming favorites. Films such as Ex Machina, The Witch, Midsommar, Hereditary, Lady Bird, Moonlight, and so many more truly amazing films played a part in defining the 2010s and had A24's involvement. But you may have noticed that I've been very careful as to not say A24 produced or created all of the movies their logo is on. This is actually on purpose because of a common misconception. A24 acts more as a distributor of films, but nonetheless, they have made a huge name for themselves and have built a really great catalog that I'm really hoping continues to deliver. These glasses, they let you see into the third dimension. On to another topic, 3D, the technology that redefined and propelled the film industry into the future. In case you didn't notice, I was being sarcastic. 3D came and seemed to have fizzled out. I remember right after the first Avatar film came out, everyone was sold on 3D. Even my parents bought a 3D TV because it seemed like it was going to be the future of movies. And it felt like every single movie that was coming out was trying to incorporate 3D in some way. Even Werner Herzog created a documentary called Cave of Forgotten Dreams about the oldest cave paintings ever found that was filmed in 3D. I never actually watched it that way, but after watching it in 2D, I'm not sure the trouble was worth it. 3D was a way that studios could make more money. The tickets to see these movies were more expensive and people were willing to pay because of the hype. But today, the hype has pretty much died down. 3D films are still being made, and the technology is being pushed further and further, most recently with how Avatar The Way of Water made some pretty big technological leaps. But it's nowhere near as popular as it used to be. The 2010s were the decade where we saw the oversaturation, and I'd even go on to say death, or at least dwindling of, 3D. It was one of the defining things of the earlier parts of the decade up until about 2016, both in theaters and with at-home technology. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Once we hit the 2020s, we started to see more 90s nostalgia. On the radio, and yes, I still listen to the radio, I keep hearing David Guetta and BB Rex's reimagining of I'm Blue by Eiffel 65 with their song I'm Good. I also keep hearing another David Guetta remix of the beloved 1990s song What Is Love. And even though Barbie was originally created in 1959, the best selling version of her came out in 1992 with Totally Hair Barbie. Although there is some debate that her coming packaged with Depp Styling Gel might have been the reason for this. But nonetheless, the 2020s are starting to feel like we're on the verge of a 90s nostalgia explosion. And something very similar happened with the 2010s and the 80s. We saw Netflix's Stranger Things, which was set in the 80s, take over pop culture. Cobra Kai, Drive, 2014's Robocop, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are just some of the films and TV shows that tried to capitalize off of 1980s nostalgia. And this fixation with the 80s and reliving some of the nostalgia was present outside the film industry as well, with things such as the release of Nintendo's NES Classic Edition, which was a huge hit. I think this has to do with the age people were back then. During the 2010s, people born in the 80s were turning 30, similar to how people born in the 90s are entering their 30s during the 2020s. This year, I turned 30 and have been feeling very nostalgic about 90s and 2000s culture, and I look forward to reliving some of that 90s nostalgia. Heck, last year I bought myself an original PS1, similar to the one I had when I was a kid. If the 90s showed us what was possible with CGI and the 2000s embraced it, then the 2010s mastered CGI. Once the 2010s came around, CGI basically took over. You'd actually be surprised by some of the places where CGI was used, such as removing Henry Cavill's mustache in Justice League. The 2010s gave us some of the best CGI we've ever seen, such as the new Planet of the Apes series where Andy Serkis delivered another amazing performance as Caesar. And if you thought Leonardo DiCaprio was actually mauled by a bear in The Revenant, well, fortunately, that was also CGI and also very impressive. Disney's live action remakes 
made headlines for their use of CGI. I think most impressively with The Lion King and The Jungle Book. These days, pretty much anything can be brought to the screen with CGI. And it's not only the big studios and movies that can make use of it, it's become very accessible for a lot of people. Even the at-home creator can now create whatever they want on a fairly low budget. Time and skill seems to be the biggest limiting factor at this point. Without CGI, I don't think we would have gotten a lot of the movies we have today, at least not at the same level of quality. But just because something exists doesn't mean it needs to be used all the time. And I still appreciate filmmakers and actors such as Christopher Nolan and Tom Cruise that try to do as much practically as they can. I also like that in the later parts of the 2010s, there seemed to be a resurgence in practical effects and how we combine them with CGI to make even better films. Technology, what is that all about? There were also a few more things on the topic of technology that are worth mentioning when it comes to the 2010s. The first one being that of streaming. During this decade, we saw the massive rise of Netflix. Netflix started their streaming service in 2007, but it wasn't until the 2010s where it really hit its stride and basically changed how we watch and think of TV and even movies to some extent. I'm not gonna go too deep on this topic because it's been covered a lot. We even have a full video talking about the streaming wars if you wanna check it out, but just know that streaming services were a huge technological shift we experienced during that decade. The next few bits of technology didn't necessarily define the decade, but they created a lot of buzz that make them worth talking about. The first one being higher frame rates, or as some people call them, alternative frame rates. The most common frame rates that we're used to are 24 frames per second, which is the norm for cinema, and then 30 or 25 frames per second, which is the norm for broadcast. 30 being the accepted broadcast standard in North America, and 25 being the standard in Europe. There are reasons for this, but we're not gonna go into that in this video. Just know that movies are typically shot at 24 frames per second. Even if you Google how to get the cinematic look, one of the suggestions is to rock a 24 FPS frame rate. But during the 2010s, we had a movie series that took a slightly different route. The Hobbit series was shot at 48 frames per second, which is double the typical frame rate. Many people didn't like it, saying it had a soap opera look to it and that it just didn't feel right in general, but it made a lot of headlines. 2019's Gemini Man also used a higher frame rate, up to 120 frames per second in some instances, but the 4K Blu-ray rendered at 60 FPS. When researching for this video, I watched some clips of the film at 60 FPS and I'm not a fan of this look at all. I'll include a link in the description if you want to check it out for yourself. Fortunately, these alternative frame rates aren't becoming too common and it seems like 24 FPS is here to stay. Although more recently, Avatar The Way of Water was shot in 48 FPS, but for good reasons this time. Reasons that I actually think helped the movie look better. It made the 3D scenes look more immersive and better overall. Another bit of technology that made headlines in the 2010s was the idea of movies shot on an iPhone. I know, it's pretty crazy that in today's world, we can make a film with something that might be in your pocket. The most notable of the films shot this way are 2018's Unsane, which was shot entirely on an iPhone 7 Plus, and 2015's Tangerine, which was shot using three iPhone 5Ss. There were still a lot of things that were used to make the movies look more professional, like different lenses mounted on the phones, audio equipment, gimbals, etc, etc but it's still really impressive that an iPhone can be used to record in such amazing quality. And finally, on the topic of technology, we have de-aging. From a variety of different Marvel films to 2019's The Irishman, de-aging is helping filmmakers tell stories in ways that don't ruin the viewer's immersion, at least when it's done well and doesn't look like there's just a floating head on a younger person's body. There isn't much to say about this one, but I have no doubt that this form of technology will continue being used into the future and become easier to implement with the help of AI. Akuna Matata. What a wonderful phrase. <laughs> The 2010s are referred to by some as the Disney decade. Disney seemed to be everywhere during this time. They revisited their own catalog by making live action remakes of a bunch of their classic cartoons to mixed reception. They also went on to buy the rights to a huge number of intellectual properties and catalogs during this time. Star Wars, Marvel, 20th Century Fox, all of these are now owned by Disney. They launched Disney Plus, their own streaming service that was built upon this massive catalog that they now owned. They pushed superhero films to heights we didn't even know were possible and continued the Star Wars story through another trilogy, a variety of standalone films, and a number of TV shows. If this doesn't prove to you that Disney was making massive moves during this decade, then just take this in. Eight of the 10 highest grossing films from the 2010s were distributed by Disney, and 14 of the 20 highest grossing films were distributed by Disney. They absolutely dominated the decade. You ain't the son of a king, you a son of a murderer. <laughs> 
The 2010s were a huge decade with regards to diversity in Hollywood. We're still very far from perfect, but I actually think the 2010s made some massive strides in the right direction. We saw a few movements that propelled Hollywood to be more diverse. The biggest ones that come to mind are the Oscars So White, the Me Too, and the Time's Up movements. The Oscars So White movement started in 2015 after the 2016 Oscar nominations were announced and resulted in the 2016 Oscars boycott. Because of this, the Academy actually went on to announce plans for how it would change diversity with the two main goals being to double the number of women and the number of diverse members in the Academy. The Time's Up and Me Too movement helped bring to light a lot of very, and I mean very disturbing things that were happening behind the scenes in Hollywood. Excuse me. There's a sign at Ramsip Park that says, do not drink the sprinkler water. We're gonna keep this section short because we were gonna talk about how television was a huge part of the 2010s, but there was so much to discuss that I actually think it warrants its own entire video. The 2010s are considered to be part of what some call the second or new golden age of television. There were a ton of amazing shows that were either ending or just beginning during this time. There were some of the best TV we've had in a while. And they helped shape television as a medium to be taken more seriously going forward. Let us know if you'd be interested in a video about this era of television and what made it so good. But that's all we have for you in this video. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on more content like this. We have a lot of cool videos in the works and would love to take you along for a ride. Oh, we also launched a Patreon that we linked in the description if you wanna help support the channel there as well. We have some cool perks to offer. But until next time, have a good one.